Really? Everybody's good? Good. Better? Why better? Man, you're so sweet. Still no pressure, can I? <laughs> Happy to see you guys. Uh, tonight's a one-man show. Usually the Dearborn Open Mic, uh, I invite a bunch of different people up here to come and speak and share uh, their, um, their poetry, their words, their talent, and it's people that come from all over our community and we see all sorts of different talents. Um, but this time, you know, I wanted to take a moment to just kind of have a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart with my community because when, uh, when I'm down, it's always been the case that the people closest to me are the ones who understand how to comfort me. And sometimes it's not really what we say or what we do. It's just the fact that we can be together in one space. So I want to start off by doing one very simple thing. Uh, it seems kind of awkward at first, but it's only because we don't do it very often. Um, so I want to start actually with some silence. I just want to sit in silence for just a minute. Uh, the moment of silence. Why do we take a moment of silence? There's actually a purpose to it. The purpose of the moment of silence is that our world is so distracting and so consuming and so deceiving that sometimes we forget what's really important and what's going on. And what's really important and what's going on is that, you know, we're here. We're here. Like, let me explain what here is. Not like virtually, not like we're here like live or we're here on a, on a phone. No, no, we are actually physically present in what we call reality. And that's why I think it's really, really important that we get together in a room together. I realize that this, uh, this show might be recorded or posted online, and we have so much of what's going on online, but it's, it's really become rarer and rarer that we get together uh, as one unit, physically, in one space. And when we do that, we exchange energy. And when we exchange energy, we realize something very important. We're not alone. No matter what's going on, we're not alone. And I think one of the reasons I really pressed everyone I could to come out here tonight is because I want one more space where uh, we can be not alone. So I want to start with just a very simple moment of silence. And the purpose of the moment of silence is let's just sit here and listen. And what are we listening for? For each other. We're listening for our presence. We're listening for the fact that we're here. And here is a really good place to be. So everyone, let's take a moment of silence starting now. When we're silent, we can hear each other. Like we can hear each other's minds, each other's souls, each other's spirits. We can't do that virtually. Virtually, we have to resort to our senses, and unfortunately, our senses are very easily deceived. We know that. So when we can get together in a space and just be together as one, um, we can finally start to exchange energy and feel where we are. Um, of course, I had many ideas about why I'd be coming up here um, today because we meet at the Dearborn Open Mic every third Wednesday of the month. So I always know that there's going to be a show and that we're going to be coming up together and sitting together. Uh, but the question is, why are we here and what purpose does it serve? And that's what we uh, come to find out and think about. Uh, today is a unique situation because it seems as though we're going to have to explore that together. And what I mean is this is not me up here really lecturing anyone on anything. Um, there is a collective necessity to come together and experience life right now together at a time when we're realizing a lot of different things about ourselves, about our community, about the world at large, and we're seeing things happen that are forcing us to rethink our paradigm and rethink our existence together. So before I start, there are a couple of things I want to mention. The first one, guys, is that my name is Yusuf. 
okay? I'm your brother. I'm your cousin. I'm your neighbor. I'm the guy who lives down the street. I'm your teacher. I'm your friend. I'm your friend's friend. And we're a family. And we need to remember that. I want to speak to you honestly. But I live in a world where being honest can be risky. Because you never know who is going to use your own words against you. And I want to know that if I'm going to start speaking in my heart here today, I'm among family. I'm among people who know and love me. And no matter what comes out of my mouth, they will know that it's coming from a place of love and from a place of trust, from a place of hope. And I want to know that we're here together to be a family. What do I mean by family? I want to remind you guys, this is, this is a character I play. His name is Wordman. What is Wordman? First of all, it's my name. I think I mentioned this before. Wordman is uh, the shortest and simplest translation of my last name, Al Qamusi. Qamus in Arabic is a dictionary. And this name isn't really my bio, it's not my actual last name. It was actually became sort of a nickname that was passed down through my family. It goes back to an ancient great great grandfather of mine who was a, a university student in a place called Najaf. And in Najaf, they have a, a university there uh, where they specialize in the study of, of the Islamic religion. And he was very skilled in language and linguistics, so much so that they started saying, they, they stopped calling him by his name, his last name, and started saying, hey, that's the guy who knows all the words, or that's the guy, the dictionary guy, Qamusi. Or as we might say today, the word man. That's the word man. And they called the son the word man, and they called uh, that guy's son the word man, and eventually got passed down over here. Uh, all the way, you know, over the generations to, uh, to my grandfather. And after my grandfather, my grandfather had three sons. Um, and those three sons, you know, were born and raised in Iraq. And then Iraq changed. It changed very suddenly. Very suddenly. It became a place they couldn't recognize anymore. And uh, during that time, it was such a drastic change that they were forced uh, to change their entire way of life. And my father, being the youngest of uh, five children, but of three boys, was forced to leave his home and seek a home elsewhere. And the home he saw elsewhere wasn't good enough for his kids, so he tried to find an even better home. And at that time, he was able to find a way to come to this country, here in the United States. But he said, I don't want to be too far away from home. So of all the places he could have lived, he picked Detroit, Michigan. I still tease him about it. I'm like, Florida? California, Dad? There aren't Muslims and Arabs in California? No, we came here. It's, um, it's a common story. I think it's the story of almost all of us. And as we go on through the generations, I think a lot of us, our children, our family, our community, are um, starting to lose sight of how we ended up here what our story actually is. You know, we are in a home, away from home. And unfortunately, sometimes we are reminded with great shock of that reality. Things happen that remind us that as home as this is, there are other homes. Homes are transcendent. Homes are spirits. Homes are people. Homes are places that never go away. And even some of us who've never been back home, we resonate so much and so strongly with what's going on at home, wherever home is. We feel pain here and we feel pain there. I consider myself very fortunate uh, for one thing that happened to me when I was younger, which is that I was introduced to the magic of words. And what makes me the word man is not so much that it's my last name, it's that I was very lucky that even against my will, uh, I was able to receive the magic of words and to learn what they're really for. Uh, I am now a, a, a school teacher. I teach at the Henry Ford Early College in Dearborn. I used to teach, I've taught in many places. I've taught at Universal Academy in Detroit, Woodworth Middle School and Fortson High, and now I'm at the Early College. I've been a teacher for 15 years. 
I'm 36 years old. I was 21 the first time I started teaching, and I taught seniors. So imagine that. I'm 21 years old. My students are 18. They did not take me seriously and, at all. In a couple of years, I'll be old enough to teach their kids because they have kids. You know, many of them got married young and, and had children, and now they're successful business owners, they're entrepreneurs, they're pharmacists, uh, they're... Um, doctors, they uh, are business owners around the community. It's incredible. You know, everywhere I go, I see somebody I know. It's, it's remarkable. And now that we're at a, a new generation, pretty much, I'm pretty much teaching the kids of my friends from high school. That's who's in my class, you know? Now that we're there, a week like this happens, and I start to watch something happen that I was talking about to a colleague just today. I was taking a walk outside today because we finally got some sun. And I walked by a colleague of mine, a teacher who works with me, who I went to high school with. And now we teach at the same school. And she didn't look good. And I said, you all right? She said, no. So what's going on? You guys know what's going on. And she said, the same thing happened to us. And I remembered Tuesday, September 11th, 2001 when I was 14 years old. It was the first half day of high school. They let us out early, even though it was a half day. I was walking out of school and one of my neighbors, he was a student with me at school, he came out and he said, they're attacking America. And we were like, you idiot. You know, like we were just coming out of school. We got home and uh, I remember walking into my home and my mom was screaming, explain to me what's going on over here. And I sat down and there was some smoke over New York City. And she said, of all the days your dad decides to go downtown for some seminar or something, I don't know what the heck is going on, what's going on? And we're watching TV and we're watching TV. And uh, we saw a plane fly into a skyscraper. And we said... Look what they're doing to our country. And we said, look what they were doing to our country. That was the first grief. You know what the second grief was? When we went, out, when we went back out into the world and said, look what they're doing to our country. People said to us, yeah, look what you're doing to our country. We said, what do you mean? They said, you did this. So who's you? They said, you. And the faces and the names showed up. And there was this moment that W.E.B. Du Bois calls double consciousness. He was a great thinker for the African-American community. His philosophy helped the slaves free themselves and eventually helped inspire the civil rights movement. W.E.B. Du Bois talks about a double consciousness which is when you have to separate yourself as two different souls in one body, you have to be part of two different identities at the same time. I read Du Bois in high school, and I was reading my story. Fifteen years later, I'm watching my own students in my classroom and in my classrooms of all my colleagues, and there are colleagues in this room right now, many of the, my fellow teachers, wondering what the heck is going on. History repeats itself. A young man up here, just in front, actually, we were just talking, and he said something I couldn't have even thought of myself was brilliant. We're talking about history, right? These two gentlemen up front, we said history repeats itself. He said, yeah, it's like a math problem, just with different numbers. It's the same formula. It's the same game. It reminds me that we're not so different at all. We may think we're different to each other. We're not different. We're the same thing. Today it's Palestine. But yesterday it was Yemen. And the day before that it was Iraq. And the day before that it was Lebanon. And Algeria. And Libya. And on and on and on. And even when it's not that, I've noticed something about our community. Any suffering inspires sadness in us. Even when we see other people when we see injustice in general, we're inspired to support because we've suffered injustice. We know what it's like. The oppressed resonate with us because we've been there. The question is, how many times are we going to repeat this formula? How many times are we going to repeat this formula? Am I going to watch 
this next generation of children go through the same traumas that me and my brothers and sisters went through? How do we change it? This is a bold thing to say, but I think I have the answer. We change it with words. We change it with stories. What's our story? You know what I realized watching the world the last few days? They really don't know our story. <laughs> they have no idea what our story is. But are we telling it? And if we are, how are we telling it? How do we tell our story? Storytelling is what survives a civilization. I'll tell you what I mean. Any of us can name a Renaissance artist, but we can't name the politician who was alive at that time. We can't name the institution that funded that artist. We can't name the place where it was set up or their art was, was put out into the world. But we know the artists and we know their work. Storytelling is how we survive. And the stories that survive their generations are the stories of hope. Not despair, not fear, not rage. They're the stories of people who went through it all and still got up and survived. You know, on any given battlefield, there's just as much horror as there are miracles. And there's just as much despair as there is hope. Because there are people who find it in their hearts and in their guts and in their spirits to continue to work through that suffering. How do they do it? I want to show you guys a few examples. Because I look around and I say to myself, if we're going to continue, we can't fix what's happening. We can't stop it as hard as we're trying to. It feels like our voices are not heard. But what's going to survive is stories. And I'll tell you what I mean. I'll give you a few examples. In ancient African cultures, and even some modern African cultures, in the tribe, in addition to the king, they designate a member of the society who is called the griot, spelled the G-R-I-O-T, the griot. And the griot has one job. His job is to remember all the stories of his tribe and tell them. And so what they do is during special ceremonies, they get together, they light a fire, they make food, they sing and dance, and then the griot gets up and he tells the story of his people and reminds them of who they are. And they make sure there's always a griot in a tribe. It is believed that in a tribe, if you kill the griot, you kill the whole tribe because they lose their identity. We have a tradition in the Islamic religion that it is incumbent upon the ummah, the entire Islamic community, that at least one person commit to memory the Holy Qur'an. It's the same idea. If we lose the words, we lose who we are. In the British tradition, they have something called the Poet Laureate. And the Poet Laureate is the person who can tell the story of his people through words. And they designate it. They give him an award. They make that person the one who comes up and tells the story of their people. Storytelling is how we survive. The question is what stories are we telling and how are we telling them? And I just want to give you a few examples. I want to read some to you. Sorry, you guys ended up with an English lesson. This is a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson. It's called The Charge of the Light Brigade. As I read this poem, I want you to realize that the way poetry is written is not so much that you're supposed to know who is being spoken about. You're supposed to fill in the blanks with your own imagination. So as I read this poem, what I'd like you to do is try to imagine what it could be talking about. I'm not going to say anything else. I'm just going to tell you it's called The Charge of the Light Brigade. And it's a poem uh, about a battle. You fill in the blanks. That's really the magic of language, is you bring your own experience into the poem and you experience it. So I'm going to read this to you. Alfred Lord Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade. 
Half a league, half a league, have a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered, stormed with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell rode the 600. Flashed all their sabers bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke. Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them volleyed and thundered. Stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of 600. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made, all the world wondered. Honor the charge they made, honor the light brigade. Noble 600. I don't know who the 600 are, but they lost. They lost the battle. But we're reading about them today. Losing is not the end. It's who tells the best story after winning and losing. There are a lot of winners we don't remember, and there are a lot of losers we do remember, because life is a game of winning and loss. When people were coming in today, I asked you what was the best part of your week, and uh, you know we got different answers. And then the young man up here up front asked me, what was the best part of your week? And the answer I got, you know, the answer that came to mind was one I, I, I would not have said out loud except for the fact that I have a responsibility to uh, tell you guys the truth when I'm on stage. And the answer is, the best part of my week was there was a moment when I was finally able to cry. And I don't remember what day it was, because I don't know what day it is anymore. Probably Monday night or Tuesday night. I'll tell you what happened. I've seen more horror in a week than I've seen in my entire life. And I couldn't cry. I saw videos, I saw pictures, I saw memes, I saw words, I saw hashtags, I saw news reports, and I could not get myself to just push that emotion over the edge. And then I was scrolling, and I saw something that surprised me. It wasn't a photo, it wasn't a video, it wasn't an argument, it wasn't some idiot on the news. It was an illustration. It was a drawing of little babies with wings over the rubble. It was art. Art helped me cry. <laughs> One of my sisters in the back asked me, why do you wear sunglasses on stage? because I don't know when I'm going to cry on stage. <laughs> it's because I don't know what's going to happen when I get up here. It's a big game of truth or dare for me when I come on stage, because I have a rule. I'm going to tell you the truth, no matter what it is. But I don't know what's going to come out. I just know that I'm going to sit up here and tell you what's really going on. I'm very glad you're here. I just want to take a moment to pause and say I'm very glad we're all here. I'm very glad we're all still here. I'm very glad we're together in one room. Somebody uh, shared with me, maybe uh, yesterday, they said, hey, I just want to give you a heads up. There's also a, a, a vigil happening during your show, Wednesday at 7. Just wanted to let you know. I said, thank God. I'm glad there's another place for people to gather. I hope there's five of these going on. I hope the whole town is full of people together in a room, experiencing, remembering, feeling, thinking, and sharing energy together. 
I want to take a moment, if we can, just a very brief second moment of silence. I want to feel the energy in this room. I want us to communicate with each other in spirit. I want to remind some of you who came in a little bit later why we're going to take a moment of silence. The goal of a moment of silence is for us to pause all distractions to experience our energies together and to feel the collective as one. It's not supposed to be awkward. It really isn't. It's a moment to just feel that this room is full of people and it's full of energy. Something we can't experience virtually. We can't experience on our phones or on a screen. We can't experience anywhere else. Just everybody together in one room. So if we could, just a moment of silence together, everyone. Let's start now. <laughs> 